Okay, now we're gonna get into what constitutes proof for something. And this is important because if you are dealing with a skeptic or a postmodernist, or just anybody who hasn't really thought about this, here's the thing, you could literally give someone 50 hours of your time, giving them every single argument you have ever learned for Christianity, and you know, you've, you've given them overwhelming levels of proof, and the person just keeps doing this, cross their arms, nod their head, and say, I'm not convinced. Unless you've established when should you be convinced, okay? What's the level of persuasion that you, know, you should attain to, to actually commit to an idea? The fact is the person who doesn't want to believe is just going to keep folding his or her arms and nod their head and say, I'm not convinced yet. And it's going to be quite unproductive. And this is also why we'll go through some other tactical issues where you got to make sure that when you are giving some information, you are requiring the other person to, to listen, to respond, to do something, to bear their own burden of proof and persuasion. Because otherwise, most of the time, what do people do? They're just ignoring you, waiting for you to be done so they can just say what they want to say. The point is, is to get, quote unquote, between their ears, right? Uh, I know that's a physicalist illustration, but uh, the bottom line is you want to get to their soul and their intellect where they're actually listening and considering what you say. And there are certain things you can do to, to help, help with that. But like I said, tactically is what we want to do. Now, uh, so to, to move back a little bit on the nature of proof, okay? Uh, I do, again, I do an integration, uh, what's called... Um, it's called juridical apologetics or legal apologetics, uh, which integrates, again, it, it's epistemology, it's metaphysics, but it's also using established legal method that, frankly, people, people have been using for 2,000 years. And why this is helpful is this, is because the fact is, every single day all over the world, People are either watching TV shows about courts and lawyers, and they've heard about evidence and proof, and you know uh, what's hearsay and what's this. And the fact is, people are somewhat familiar with legal terms and legal ideas. Okay, that's number one, and and so you'll be able to make a pretty good connection with people already, based on the fact that most people have some experience, you know, observing the legal system, you know, how accurate it is or not. But you'll be speaking on familiar terms. You start talking about modified foundationalism and things like that with people, you're gonna lose the average person right away who hasn't studied epistemology. So on that, why use juridical or legal apologetics? And this is why, this is why it's helpful in this case. It's because when you think about lawyers and Christian apologists, we actually have a lot in common because why? We're in the business of proving things. And why for Christianity, if you've thought about this, is because when you look at all the world religions and the ideas, the worldviews, it's Christianity truly almost alone that is based on history. See, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, start going down the list, most of the pagan systems, it's irrelevant whether their founders and leaders ever existed. It's the ideas behind it that count. But with Christianity and the biblical religion, the fact is, if, if there, in fact, was no incarnation of the second person of the Trinity, that there was no God-man, that that, that's a historical claim and statement, real facts, evidence, and historical claim. If, there, if this Jesus did not really live his sinless, perfect life, if he did not die on a cross, truly die, and was raised from the dead, three days later, there is no Christianity. Paul says, if Christ is not risen, our faith is empty, we're still in our sins. Christianity and the Bible stakes its claim on the historical truthfulness and accuracy of these events. Now, why is that significant for a legal apologetic? Because the very rules of evidence and the rules of argument for inclusion and presentation of evidence are really for one purpose, and it's this, to establish to a certain level of persuasion and certainty, a little snapshot of human history. So take, for example, in criminal law, 
What you've got is, let's say, did this person actually commit a burglary? That they, you know, break and enter in a dwelling at night with the intent to commit a felony therein. That's a historical statement. So what you're doing with the presentation of evidence is to show that this historical event, the facts, actually occurred. There was person A that he actually broke and entered into a dwelling at night, okay, and intended to commit a felony. Now, that doesn't establish the law, but what the evidence does is establish the facts, okay? So this is why when we look at the very nature of juridical apologetics or legal apologetics, it focuses on reestablishing a little snapshot of history to the right degree or, or level of certainty. And this is why it's so important because we can use the same tactics to say, did Jesus actually walk the earth, die, and, and rise again from the dead? And these are things that we can actually show to a high degree of certainty using, again, this historical legal methodology. So with that, that's why when we look at this conceptually, uh, it's important that, uh, again, we can use this, use these standards of proof and talk about what constitutes evidence uh, and so forth. So when we begin the process here, uh, there's a lot of things that we talk about with respect to what counts as evidence, okay? There's physical evidence, there's testimonial evidence, okay? The testimonial evidence can be in certain forms, like oral or written. Uh, physical evidence can be like the gun itself from which we can, uh, we can draw an inference on these things. So we have direct and circumstantial evidence. And again, uh, both of those are valid. Don't believe the TV show that somehow diminishes circumstantial evidence, because the fact is, if a proper inference is drawn, it's just as good as direct evidence. So all that to say is that as we cover these principles, we're going to start going through and saying, look, does this count? for inspiration, and we'll go through, you know, after we're done with the nature of proof, we'll look at the specific arguments for what counts as proof for inspiration. So on that, let's take a quick break and we'll come back and start sort of a formal presentation on the burden of proof, burden of persuasion, and level of persuasion. Thanks.